here's the other thing that everybody will need to right off the bat is having a rainy day fund in your business or a way to get financing. Well, we had a great interview today with Drew Root uh, at, uh, what is he? Rate Zero, Rate zero. is his name. Yes. Right. Uh, I really enjoyed, you know, we haven't touched a lot on individual agents and ISOs and how they're progressing in today's market. But uh, today, today's uh, topic, disaster recovery, is something we also haven't covered. And, and Drew has a had right. a, a front row seat to um, to yeah, managing. Really, really that. more of a really today is more of a horror story of uh, what to do when you go after one vertical with a great solution, and next thing you know, the solution provider says, "Guess what? In six weeks." We're not going to be supporting this anymore, and none of your merchants are going to be able to process payments. What yeah. do you do? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting. After you, then, start, after you pull out your hair, what do you do next? Yeah, what right. do you do next? Right? Yeah. So uh, then, um, I kind of continue that a little bit to talk about some of the dangers of processor agnostic solutions, what mm -hmm. to do about it, and how to approach integrated solutions in the industry. Um, and then, Patty, tell us about uh, what you discussed in the insiders. Very interesting today. Uh, Fed now, and you know some uh, analysis that's been done on what the implications are going to be for other payment rails. We'll just keep it at that. Uh, Please listen all the way through the end so that you can learn about that. And uh, this episode is brought to you by Nativia. That's right, Nativia Banking. You can head over to ccsalespro.com slash Nativia if you want to learn more about that. Uh, Drew Root, although actually I did a little consulting for Drew a long time ago when he was first getting started in the and business. And so did I about a year or two ago. So we yeah, must you did admit. some writing. So we both worked yes. with him, but we're, we don't have any current relationship. Just a great conversation with a great guy. So let's dive yeah. in and get started. Hey everybody, Patty and I are here today with Drew Root. How are you doing today, Drew? I'm doing great. Thanks. Awesome. So uh, I've known Drew for a while. Patty has as well. And, you know, today we are talking about disaster strikes in the ISV world. I guess the right way to put it. But the idea is, well, how do you manage these ISV relationships when, of course, at just a drop of a hat, all of a sudden, all hell can break loose. They can say, well, we're no longer servicing the merchant or they can try to they can they, we're going to steal all the processing accounts or who knows all these crazy things that can happen. Drew had the unfortunate situation of going through that recently with his ISO. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, but before we do that, Drew, I would love for you to give our audience a little flavor of kind of your history in the industry. So, you know, tell us about your journey. How did you get into this crazy industry? And then how did you end up specializing in the vertical that you specialize in today? Uh, that That's uh, that's an awesome question. Um, we all have our own little uh, journeys that we yes. make to get where we're at. And uh, I was in national sales um, for a small fruit company in uh, Cupertino. I okay. was in the number one national sales guy for them. And uh, a little while after that, I um, went to work for American Express as a territory manager and managed um, a little over 15,000 businesses here in Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin. And uh, I got a real good view. Uh, I wasn't really selling anything. I was just coming in, talking to them, explaining what was going on, um, how American Express was there to help, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, over that time, I heard a lot of merchants, um, you know, they always complain about uh, merchant processing fees, or I got a good view of the technology that they were using. Right. And so I, what I learned from that was there's some really good opportunity here. Hmm. And so um, I, this was early 2018. I started to put a model, build my model and put that together and uh, looking for resources online. And I, this thing called Google, I Googled, uh, you know, the credit card processing business and it, lo and behold, um, this guy, James came up. And so I, uh, every morning when I was on my walk, I'd listen to a podcast and I would just, awesome. it was, uh, invigorating and it just helped me, um, start my business in a way that started off on the right foot. So thank you very much for that. Our pleasure. And as I'm going through this and I'm, I'm learning this, I'm like, um, you know, this is something I, I, I think I can really sink my teeth into. I really have the history, the technology piece I had from Apple. I had a real good insight to how Apple works and and something that you don't get coming through the front door. Same with American Express. And so I built this um, idea 
because I've really enjoyed the owners of liquor stores. They are the most sarcastic bunch of people you'll <laughs> ever meet because of uh, probably their customers. Right. And so I learn it and I'm like, you know, I think I can, I think I can help them along to be more profitable, give them better tools and work in the mom and pop space. So instead of just going in and being like, Hey, I'm just going to, um, get the enroll asphalt and take everybody that I can. It was very deliberate. And I didn't know the industry as well as I thought I did. And so going in and talking to the owners and learning their business before, and I think it was, it was a podcast that you had talked about, uh, um, about sales and sales techniques. And one of them is if you don't go in and you're not selling anything, you're just asking questions. Hey, this, is this a really good idea? You think this would work? You think this will work in your business? Um, it really, it really paid off. And so, very first account spent spent a lot of time. I'm a white glove guy. I I um, I feel like there's a lot of people that don't understand technology. They don't understand right. a part of the business, and so they they um, compensate in another way. So maybe they're not really customer service focused, but they're process focused. Mm-hmm. And what I've done is I've come in and I've grown my business and and um, and with that I I had uh, partnered with um, a solutions provider and we'll get into a little bit of the challenges of of um, you know picking just one and right. what what that can mean for you. Right. But yeah, so you had to, you had to find the right technology. You're do, basically doing all the things we talk about in the podcast, right? You're targeting a specific vertical. You're going in doing the survey pitch. You're understanding the market. You're finding the right solution provider. I assume you probably <laughs> white labeled it and made it your own. Sort of. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Right. And then you, then you go in and you start selling it to a specific vertical. So then we're going to get into what happened when they basically just, you know, pull the rug out from under you. But before we get to that, um, Talk about some of the unique challenges, specifically just because of your specialty here, our audience is going to be interested, dealing with liquor stores in general, but specifically in your state where I believe municipalities have a major role and maybe even you know, owner operated, but definitely always these are heavily regulated. Um, what is the, What was that challenge like as far as just working with the municipalities and the liquor stores? Tell our audience a little bit about that vertical, if you would. It's funny. So as you're sitting there and you're going through that that list, I'm, right. I can almost tell you which episodes were the podcast where I'm like, yeah, I listened to that one. <laughs> right, sure. I added that to my business. I listened to that one. So th- there's a lot of this that uh, that you have done that maybe falls on deaf ears, but it really is very valuable. Listen to every podcast, listen to every piece of information and reprogram your software so that you can be number one in this business, Right. Uh, the challenges in Minnesota, uh, there is a large segment of the store. So we're a blended state. So the municipal stores um, are stores that cities can run um, and they block out all the competition. So there is to buy your liquor, you, you know, beer, wines and spirits, you have to go to a municipal store and some locations, some cities have three locations, some have one. And they're, they, it's highly regulated. There's a process. There's no, when you, when you talk about an owner, there's not one decision maker. So I've had to uh, learn that process. Um, You probably, there's a little sign right behind my head. It says MLBA. I put that up. Um, So there's, there's a lot of organizations that um, your businesses, in my particular instance, the Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association, and that those are for the private companies, but then they also work with, um, there's an MMBA, which is the Minnesota Municipal Biz- Beverage Association. Those were all the cities that have a municipal store. And so I was able to go in and use a lot of those resources huh. and uh, learn learn how they work, what the process looks like. Right. Um, what events to go to, what events not to go to, and the rest of that. And so I've learned over time uh, how to be a great liquor store owner, how to be a great uh, uh, work with the cities. And here's the one thing that I would tell you about working with a city. 
uh, for the people that have a challenge that have a vertical, it could be utilities, it could be right. uh, whatever they're in. Once you're in, you're in. Yes, and you will have it. Um, my business partner is a is an attorney. My business partner, every time we get a city, he's like, "Oh, you just got an annuity. Oh, you just you just landed an annuity." Yeah, and so great. as long that. as you white glove <laughs> it and you take care of those people. Yeah, those people will take care of you. And yeah. so uh, that kind of, you know, when you talk about the challenges and white labeling and, you know, yep. branding your own software and the rest of it, it all starts with your relationship with the merchant. The mm -hmm. rest of this stuff that we talk to you the rest of the day yep. doesn't matter. If you don't have a relationship and you don't know, uh, you yeah. can't make small talk and talk about their kids playing chess or, uh, you know, they're, uh, where they're going on vacation or right. any of those pieces. If you can't have that discussion, you need to literally finish this podcast, get in your car and go visit your accounts. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you had said in one of the podcasts is about time blocking. Yeah. And I still, to this day, time block. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm like, okay, I need to be out. I need to know. I, and I'm learning the business. So I changed my time block because there's times that deliveries show up. There's times that it's super busy and you just don't want to be in the store. Yeah. And that's, that's an important part. Value their time. Right, right, right. Okay. So let's get down to the topic at hand. As I understand it, you received very short notice. What about six weeks that the POS yeah. systems you've been installing at customer locales uh, would no longer be supported. Now, I'm sure you were freaking out, <laughs> but what was the first thing you did after the initial shock to get yourself on the path of recovery? Well, there was a, there's probably a text to my attorney friend, attorney business partner. Um, and I think it was something to the effect of we are, and I'll let you yeah. audience fill in what that <laughs> yeah. rhymes with truck. <laughs> um, yeah. and so then from there from what I did from there was you know I, I'm like I, I had this in the back of my head I had this mindset that I can't have all my eggs in one basket and there's got to be a solution you got to have a, a you know the, there has to be a solution either that I own or that is right. something that I can, can have better control over Mm -hmm. um, you probably have seen the memes for this wasn't in the bingo card for 2023. <laughs> that was probably my very first one was I did not think that I would be fired as a client. Right. Right. And so that, right. that was, that to me was like, um, I thought maybe like, Hey, somebody comes in and buys it. And then I have to change my white labeling and change this nowhere in there. Is there the uh, getting fired as a client? Yeah. And, and so, I, yeah, and I think one thing that would be helpful in this, and you know, of course, we're not going to name any names because we don't want to disparage anybody on the podcast and things like that. But I think it's actually really interesting in this particular case to give a little extra context. Um, you know, there is an ISV, and the ISV basically realized that they could make a lot more money when they did the processing in house versus working with the ISO channel. And so um, what usually happens in those cases is that the ISV starts to try and steal merchant accounts, but because this particular ISV did have rock solid contracts and relationships and all that, they ended up bringing everything in house and just saying, well, we're not going to support the ISO channel anymore. We're just going to sell our own processing and, and solution, which they had already been building out for quite some time. Um, and obviously a, an inadvisable timeline with which to do this. But um, I think that's interesting because, you know, it, that what we're talking about right now, for those of you that have these external processor agnostic partnerships, now this needs to be on your radar. You could be fired as a client, not just, we're always mm -hmm. worried about they're going to steal the processing. We're always worried about they're going to raise rates. We're always worried about these other things to your point, Drew, but most of us are not thinking about, well, we're going to get a notice and say, we are no longer supporting this thing that you have. Right. So, yeah. 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 So that, that the, the couple of things that I learned right off the bat is, Contracts, contracts, contracts are very mm -hmm. important. Yes. Um, you you guys had somebody on the other day um, who was talking about I love I, I have uh, I have beers with Bob on Friday and Bob's a great guy and the rest of it. 
Right. But at the end of the day, Bob's not going to be there. Right. And I have to relate, I have to go with the black and white of what's on the contract. Right. And I think what I've learned in that whole piece is uh, I'm more, uh, it's great to have an attorney, mind you. And I would tell everybody, find somebody, have a relationship, make them a small, make them a small partner in your business is even better mm-hmm. uh, because then they have a vested interest to help you grow. And if they right. get anybody in the rest of it, those are important pieces, yeah. but the contracts, the contracts, the contracts, the contracts, making sure that everything is buttoned down. Do I have enough time? How long is it going to take? I, I mean, if you had um, 5,000 clients that you had to find a new solution for and you had to find new hardware and you had to, you know, the the list goes on and on and on, what would you do? Right. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that would, um, they might change uh, uh, complete fields because uh, I think you've said this before, James, this is a small industry. There's a hundred thousand people that do this work. Right. You will be, uh, you will never be able to do this work again unless you have a plan. Because right. those merchants are going to tell all their other merchants and yep. they're going to see that and yep. people are going to see it. Nobody's going to want to do this. I spent the last eight weeks. Um, I just finished last yesterday at two o'clock, um, two o'clock in the afternoon. I was up since two o'clock in the morning converting people over. And, uh, you know, you got to get people trained, their employees trained. They got to be right. able to conduct business. Right. Um, is it secure? Is the hardware great? Can I get the hardware? Right. I mean, the list goes on. You know, what's the communication plan? Mm-hmm. Um, when I first got the notice, you know, I communicated with my partners, but then I had to fall back on all of the goodwill that I built with these clients. Right. And so I came in and one thing that I told them and Everybody who's in business, everybody has a vendor for something. Right. Uh, if it's liquor, if it's clothing or the rest of it. Right. And so I simply fall, fell back on the knowledge that I had that they have vendors just like I do. Right. And I just said to them, I said, I had a vendor and I'm going to tell you right now, my 2023 bingo card, nowhere in there was licensing. Uh, the licensing was going to go away for what I'm doing. Yeah. I said, it's unfortunate, but I've spent time. I knew this was coming at some point, not this, but I needed to have a disaster recovery plan. Right. And so I have this other version of software that, it com- that basically I'm paying a competitor to come in right. and do this work. Yeah. And so they were, they understood that because they understood in their line of work, maybe the distributor that distributes Tito's vodka uh, who should be a sponsor of this podcast, by the way. <laughs> I don't see uh, them back there on your shelf. I only see the uh, bourbon no back there. That's, uh, that's all allocated bourbon. That's, okay. that's my that's my one. Uh, yes, that's a whole other story. <laughs> uh, but you you come in and they have, all of a sudden, they're, they're the people that they get something from, they understand that. And they're able to, and so you what you tell them is, is, um, you you have to tell them, um, look, I got really bad news for you. And everybody's mind immediately goes to the worst case scenario. Yes. And then when you tell them, it's like, I'm going to get you a new POS. They're like, oh, I'm not going to get, you know, I'm not going to die. Yeah. Oh, yep. No, no that's right. You're, and you just, you got to fall on the sword. You can't just hide from them. Right. You just right. go in and you have that conversation. Hey, I got really bad news for you. Right. Uh, one of my one of my one of my vendors pulled up the ten ten stakes. It wasn't on my my card, but I do have a disaster recovery plan. Um, I'm gonna be able to do all of these same things, and I'm gonna tell you out of out of disaster comes opportunity. Mm-hmm. And this community of the hundred thousand people that do this work, I have now met. Um, I think it happens for a reason, and I would tell you that I have developed a new relationship with another um, ISV that I would have not been able to get through the front door at. And this is one where um, I explained my business model and how my business works and the rest of it. And they are, they are supporting me versus where I was at before, which was, 
I, you know, I got a phone call, Hey, what can we do to help you? And it's like, that's not really a help. It's what helps is having tools and processes and applications and right. all of these things that you need to make your business easy and run. Those are the important things. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, assuming I'm assuming that you didn't go with the same with one POS system going forward. Is that, is that a correct? No, assumption? no, I did not. So, I, so going forward, I have two, I have two solutions. So here's the other thing that everybody will need to right off the bat is having a rainy day fund in your business or a way to get financing or the rest of it. There might be a, yeah. a, an event later today that you could probably get on and probably learn a little bit about banking and the rest of that. Yep. Um, you, you need to have a rainy day fund because that hardware no matter what, will never work with the same, like, oh, I right. bought all iPads. And the next people are like, yeah, I use Android and there's no way to do it. Right. Everything's great. And now I got to replace, and I'm, you know, my my outlay is, I've got to figure out where to come up with the cash. And now I got all these extra parts. What do I do with the extra parts? Right. Um, and so this whole thing is taught me about having redundancy, mm -hmm. having a solution that I know the answers to, um, not every, not every buddy is going to fit into some solution too. Instead of me trying to pigeonhole somebody in, Hey, I got two solutions for you. And if right. you have that, you're going to actually, they're going to make the choice. And so you can always fall back yeah. on, you chose that. I, I just presented it. Right. 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 Yeah. Right, plus right, plus right. you give them the, the yes or yes option. Right when you're selling it, because really now now you're now you're selling again, really, because you're saying right. the sale is: Are you going to stay with me even though this is a mess, or are you going to leave? And it's great to say, well, would you like to stay with me with option one, or would you like to stay with option two, which right. is better for you, right? Right, <laughs> right, right. Yes right. No. So. How did you so go it, about it, though, just deciding which option, you know, what were option one and two? I mean, was it looking for somebody that could be specific? to your vertical or was it more expansive? So having a disaster, so think of you, you have a, if you have a disaster, mm -hmm. right? You need people that are going to be able to support you today, actually right. yesterday, not even today. They're right. going to need to be able to just support walk you. walk right in. And yeah, they just need, I need to be able to. And so having technology that allows me to remotely access and remotely deploy mm. really is a big part of yeah. the business. I don't have to show up at mm -hmm. every single location, even though I may, even though I want to, sure. I'm able to remotely ta take and manage my equipment. Mm. And that's something that Apple taught me. Yes. And so it was really mm -hmm. great because the, I just rolled stuff off and the hardware all stayed the same. I mean, that was all part of that oh, disaster nice. recovery piece is like, I made a list. This is the hardware that I have. So right. having consistent hardware mm -hmm. uh, is okay, but it's not the best because giving those people a solution, two different solutions, most of them will get, are going to be like, oh, I know how an iPad works or I know how this works. Right. And that's how they go in and they do that. And so what we, what I've done is I've, I've been like, I want to have um, all of the things that I'm not going to want to step on a rake. You know, I'm tired of stepping on a rake either it hits me in the face. I do that I, in my gardening I, all the time. I'm sorry to say. Know, right? You know, the worst one is the one that hits you in the back of the uh -huh. head because you didn't see it. Right. right. And, then and you, the, you can see the one come in and you try to catch it. <laughs> but the ones that you can't see are the ones where, you know, you need to evaluate all of your business and figure out what, one, why do, why would somebody leave you? But also back, the, the backstream is like, the data and recovery. So right now I don't have the access to get the data for my merchants. Mm. So having the ability to get the data before there's a problem, I want to okay. be able to go, Hey, I need this solution. Um, and I need to be able to find this data. How do I find this data? And also encouraging your accounts because whose data is it really? Is it my data, your data? Whose data is it? I don't mm -hmm. know whose data it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, a lot of times you end up with things like what you're talking about. Maybe it's inventory, right? Those types of things where, you know, tax records, 
<laughs> tax records. There you go. Oh, wow. Yeah. In your business, that's going to be crazy. So yeah, right. you know, you so but, you're going to have like, this is like the merchant's data, but the idea is, is the vendor contractually obligated to then provide that data in the event that they are no longer able to service the account and things of that nature? Crucial, crucial stuff. But when you're doing contract negotiation. Right. Right. And the, yeah. And so being able to get the data in a format too, that is you can use it later on. Right. Um, right. You know, from a regulatory standpoint for tax data, sales tax data and right. liquor tax, that stuff is supposed to be kept for seven years. Right. Yeah. So right. you, if you can tell me, uh, you know, if you can say today, I'm going to be with this same provider seven years from now, I'm going to tell you, you probably won't. Right. At some point you're going to switch Something comes yep. along, there's a new technology that integrates right. um, AI that does something this and brushes your teeth in the morning and off you go. And, right. you know, you're, you're getting all this technology and you're like, oh, I'm going to get I'm going to get something new. And it's like, yeah. what happens to your old data? And, and um, yeah. how do you get that new data forward? It's one thing to be like, when I first started, I didn't have any data. I didn't have any inventory data. And the business that I'm go was going into is very skew and U UPC oriented. Sure. And so being able to build the database, well, that same piece, how does it transfer to your next POS? Is it is it compatible? How do you export it? All of these pieces, you really need to have somebody when you're thinking about your disaster recovery, how do you get somebody to move the data from one place to the other? Right. Who's going to do it? Is it going to be you, James? Right. I think you could probably do it. Patty, you could probably do it. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be, you're going to be chat GPT, right. you know, act as a programmer. Right. Here's the following right. data and right. export. And you're yep. going to try to get your data over to, yep. to the new POS. Well, yep. that whole period of time, if you have, you know, a considerable amount of accounts, you're going to have to figure out a way to do that. Right. So James, I know you've talked about, um, having developers and the rest of that piece yeah you as part of your disaster recovery is you need somebody who understands your system right. independently that you can be like you bring them in and you go okay we're going to do a test run so don't wait till it breaks right i want you to tell me how you can get this data and we can move it right. someplace else what format how do i yeah. get it all the rest of it well i think i think just one of the other interesting things that we found at our with our business is that you know, data backup services at this point are so, you know, cost effective. You know, it's so, yeah. so inexpensive to have servers. I mean, we have one of our junior developers who literally every week he goes through all of our various systems and all the data that we own that we need gets backed up on a separate server and that backup gets updated. And so it's like, you know, yeah. when you do, when you put processes like that in place and you say, well, well, my vendor won't allow me to do that go find another vendor. Like, you, mm -hmm. right, you got it. Their yeah. backups are like, I mean, that's that's IT 101. You have to have backups of every piece of data that you're responsible for that's important. And then when something happens, you go back and say, hey, I've got really bad news for you. And like you said, Drew, they're thinking, oh no. And you're like, I lost the last three days of your data. Oh, okay. Like I have the last yeah. seven years. I just lost the last seven years, days right. since I did the last backup. Right. It's like, okay, we can deal with that, right? And, and we can get to a right. new system, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that I think that's the key is like you all of the things that you don't really realize, like all of the data data is things like, you know, UPCs, it could be customer, it could be right. What happens to your gift cards? So you're selling mm -hmm. gift cards. Right. How does the gift cards transfer from one? Nobody right. has. There's no um, <laughs> ISO standard for gift cards. No, right. There is uh... like the liabilities report on the, on the gift cards. And you're going, Oh, great. I got the liability report. Now what do I do with it? Right. And so, right. and there's no numbers to it. There's no names. There's none of the rest of it. Right. And so, you know, one, one, somebody uses a barcode, somebody uses a scanner, somebody uses a piece of paper and you're, you're trying to figure out how, how do I get all this data in? How do I do all this? And, uh, and then, you know, you got to remember this stuff doesn't happen where you can be you have time to think about it you think about it while you think about it while the skies are blue right and it's really if you see them great but you should be able to fix and do those things yeah. ahead of time i wish you know that um you know if you're looking for james if you're looking for a sponsor there's got to be somebody out there that could that it could hang a hat 
that could sponsor your show and come on and do this exact, this piece for technology. There are a lot of Luddites that are out here, not to disparage Luddites because they're great people. (laughs) Um, But that you, you, you have people that don't know um, the first thing. And it's like, there's a one, it's a technology 101. And then how do you train people? Right. So now you have all your accounts and you've switched over. How do you train everybody all at the same time? Right. All in the new equipment and the new software and Uh, everything's uh new. Yes. uh It's it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And so I I think it's so interesting. I think it's just so interesting. I think it, it, uh, you know, and I mean, the specific example you're talking about, of course, impacted a lot of people in this industry, but I think it's really just good for the industry as a whole to like reevaluate, you know, especially the processor agnostic solutions that you have. And I'm going to talk more about that in the next segment, but, you know, looking at them and saying, okay, wait a second, what could go wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, and then saying, okay, well, if that went wrong, what would I do? And let me just go ahead and do that now. And let's see, do mm-hmm. I have, are there three other companies that could do what this company does? And are they, or would they, would I be able to work with them? Maybe I should place, maybe I should place one or two of their systems. Right. And right. You see, and right. And, and so I think that's so important. You have to start disaster management as, as we've talked about it. It's all about that. Say when things are going really well, think about what could go really wrong. Right. And then go ahead and do that thing that you would do and see if it works. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you, you could either look like a hero or a zero, right? Yeah. You could yeah. either come in and be like, Hey, I got this solution. This is my disaster recovery. I knew at some point I would have some problems. Um, you know, I got really bad news. You know, you're going to, the way that you do your transact, your business in the morning, you know, I, I gave people the recipe. A POS system is like a, is like baking brownies, Right. At the end, at the beginning, you have your ingredients. At the end, you end up with brownies. It the the system before maybe the eggs went in before the cocoa. In this example, your cocoa goes in before the eggs, and you, you know the analogies work really well. And so, being right. able to, you know, hey, this is this system's going to work great. Right. That's for your great part time employee, but the the manager who has to come in and run reports. Right. You know, cash is the lifeline of a business. And if you start yeah. messing with that, yep. they, people have a tendency to, yeah. you know, you become a horror flick for a movie. Yeah. 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 Well, this is great stuff, Drew. I really, really appreciate uh, you, yep. you sharing your experiences with us. Um, you bet. Is there anything, Drew, is there anybody that uh, if they wanted to connect with you, you mentioned earlier that you've made so many connections in the industry since this all happened, which is awesome. Um, where yeah. would people look you up? Are you active on LinkedIn or where should people go to find you? If you uh, to LinkedIn, uh, you know, you can email and uh, we can start. People want a little more detail. You can you can tell uh, I'm a talkative guy. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry that you each only got five words in. I apologize. Oh, no, we uh, wanted to hear your story. It worked out right. Great, yeah, so. right. Um, you can do uh, Drew at, so D-R-E-W at R-A-T-E-Z-E-R-O dot net. Awesome. Just send me an email. Love Excellent. it. Thank Drew, you. thank you so yeah. much for your time today and sharing your story. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Nativia Banking. Now, two things about Nativia Banking you need to understand. One is the reseller program where you can actually resell banking services to your merchant and earn residual when your merchants use their card to spend money. So think of it, imagine if you know their merchant deposits are going into a different bank account and mm-hmm. you're kind of the banker providing these right. banking services. Um, but the other and the more immediate benefit to our audience today when you're while you're listening to this episode is maybe that's a little too complex. You're starting to understand it better. But today, what you need to do is just open your own bank account with Nativia and use it to deposit your residuals. They have a fantastic way to pay residuals out to sub agents, which is really unique, Patty. It's very cool um, where you get your own card, you give it to your sub agents, they get instant access to money. It's pretty cool. But the other thing is you you get access to low cost capital. So by depositing your Mm -hmm. residuals in this account, um, Vlad and the team at Nativia are going to give you access to low cost capital so you can borrow against that residual and just some really creative things there. So definitely go to ccsalespro.com dot com slash Nativia, N-E-T-E-V-I-A. Check it out. So Patty, today in questions from the field, I just have to continue the dialogue that we had with Drew and I have to Excellent. talk about you know the direction of the industry for just a minute because mm-hmm. um, though there was a post in my own Facebook group recently that I found so comical um, where uh, a person who will remain nameless posted kind of a, a little bit of a negative snarky uh, post about how uh, in a few hours I'm recording this, uh, doing this event when Nativia banking and the idea was, well, yeah, well, this is crazy. Nativia also sells merchant services. 
why would we work with them on the banking side? Um, and it just was so interesting That's to me. That's pretty because, short-sighted. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me because it's so, it's, it's it, it, a complete lack of understanding of kind of how this industry is going. Like we just talked to Drew about. The idea is, well, of course, this, this person who made the post is an individual agent. And in their mind, the only thing they could even fathom is that they would work with Nativia Banking as a processor agnostic thing to provide mm -hmm. banking services to their current merchants. Right. But then they're going to lose, honestly, a lot of the benefits because they're not going to get the real-time deposits and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas to me, I'm, I'm presenting the industry with lots of different options now of integrated solutions. So you know, to, to my, the my, way I look at it is maybe you're going after a vertical where banking would be a big deal, right? If you are, you probably want to do a payment processor that also has neo banking services, right. right? If you're going after liquor stores, as we talk about, you know, you want to find a processor that has, you know, uh, that because, you know, Drew mentioned several times of not having all of his eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. I actually disagree with that to a point. I like having all my eggs in one basket as long as I'm the one that owns the basket. Right. <laughs> You know, <laughs> where you have to be careful is when you have all your eggs in somebody else's basket. Else's basket. That's where you run into a problem. Right. So my advice to the Asian ISO community today is this, okay? The industry is changing structurally. It is changing, okay? If you are working processor agnostic today, you are at a greater risk than if you are not. Now, does that mean you should never go processor agnostic? No, I'm not saying that. But if you're going to go processor agnostic, you better have the best attorney out there. You better be reading those agreements. You better have every little thing covered. Um, I haven't promoted, you know, processor agnostic solutions in quite a while because there's so many inherent risks of, of them going after the processing, whatever. So to me, rather than saying, well, I want to go with a, a company that is so far removed from payment processing that there's no risk. <laughs> like that's a risk in itself. That is the largest risk because yes. guess what? If they're making money right now and they're not involved in payment processing at all, what is the single best thing they could do to increase their EBITDA? Get into processing. Mm -hmm. Hello. So, and at the same time, your merchants are going to have a much better experience when they're dealing with one company to provide all the various things that they need. Now, as an individual agent, is it realistic for you to own everything? No, obviously not. Is right. it realistic for you to work with a company who owns everything? Mm -hmm. Maybe, depends on the vertical, right? But the goal shouldn't be, let me see if I can piece this out. So I'm dealing with 17 different companies who yeah. each have a processor agnostic thing because I really want to make sure all the processing is with one company. Why right. on earth would you do that? Like right. as if the processing, you think that's the differentiating factor? You think that your payment processing all being with one company, that's what your merchants are going to care about most? What are you thinking? No. Yeah. Yeah, that's... The thing your merchants are going to care about is the point of sale system, the neo banking services, the, the capital that you make available to them, the loyalty programs, the online marketing services, on and on and on. It's technology. Right. So the idea that we want to say, let's make sure nothing is integrated or no, 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 no. You're thinking about it wrong. Look mm -hmm. for new opportunities and then find a company that has multiple services that are together. Yes. I'm from, I have a, a company sponsor here at Nativia that does neobanking and payment processing. Why? Because they go together. So right. yeah, the idea would be, you know, and, and also because you, if you deal with a big processor, they're going to be doing neo banking as well in three years. They're probably already working with Vlad, but you know that's another story. But that's the idea. Like you want the integrated solution. You don't want it all separated out. So right. find a vertical you want to go after, and then find the right integrated solution. And guess what? To this day, I do not know of a point of sale company who also does the processing, right? Who is then coming in and saying we need to steal all of the mm -hmm. account because. You know, now again, if there's, I, I probably shouldn't say that. I'm sure that has happened if there's a bad contract. But I'm saying when you negotiate that contract, they're not going to change their business model on you because they're you're both making a lot of money. There's a there's a shared thing, and so that's why for me and believe me, if you don't think I have processor agnostic companies reaching out to me every day asking to be my sponsor, yeah, you're dreaming. Okay, I say no to almost all of them because I and I, I tell all of them very very honestly. I'm like, look, there's very specific situations where I think this can really work. And yes. I do believe in that. There are some that I think that could really, really work. Um, Bill or Genie, great example of that. I've been working with Bill or Genie. Um, mm -hmm. They have a processor agnostic because of the market they're in. I think it makes a lot of sense the way they're connecting the dots. But by and large, you're looking at point of sale companies 
you really want to be tightly integrated. Same thing with banking services. So look for ways to have an integrated solution for your merchant. Don't look for ways to protect yourself by going process agnostic. Well, here's this week's inside scoop. Fed now will not cannibalize the card networks. Okay. Maybe eventually, but not anytime soon. Hmm. Now, of course, we've discussed this in past episodes, um, you know, the significance of Fed now. Um, and don't get me wrong, it is significant. But here's the thing. Changes in the payments habits take time. Sometimes they take generations to make a significant difference. I mean, look no closer than at uh, contactless. I've, I've said before, I wrote the first, ar my first article that I wrote about a contactless solution was from first data in the 1990s. Wow. And it's only now just taking right. off. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, we, you know, another example would be uh, the latest payments data from the Fed shows that there were 12 billion with a B checks written last year with wow. an average value of about $1,900. Wow. Hmm. Now, of course, that shows that, you know, that's skewing high. So it's right. probably a lot of businesses. Probably, probably used to be $200 at some point. Right. You know? Yeah. So, in fact, yeah. 1900 is up from about 17 and something. Um, sure. A few years so later. skewing earlier. more towards B2B transactions and that sort of thing. Exactly. Probably. Now, the Fed uh, reported that there were 143.6 billion card payments in 2021. That's because it does this, you know, every three years it does a survey and then it takes a couple of years to crunch its data. The average value of a card transaction, $564. Big hmm. difference. Right. But back to Fed now. Um, the new real-time payment network went live in July but activity remains low while banks and processors line up to get certified. It's a big deal though, because Fed now can move and settle payments faster than any other payment rail. And wholesale pricing at about, I think it's 4.5 cents per transaction undercuts every other available option, even after markups, you know? Yeah. Um, but as a new report out of Moody's explains, new payment rails take time to catch on. Um, here's how Moody's put it. The services impact on the two big card networks is several years away and will largely depend on broad consumer adoption, which remains uncertain. Yeah, sure. You know, the card networks provide value to consumers and businesses that would prove difficult to replicate. Mm -hmm. um, these, as Moody said, quote, these include ease of use, global acceptance, dispute resolution, ability to make returns, dual messaging, zero liability, enhanced security, the list goes on. Right. You know, sure. uh, for now, the most obvious use cases for Ned, Fed now include those that have lagged in the transition to electronic payments, like checks in the B2B sphere. Right. Um, as we've discussed in the past, B2B is a huge market. Um, one of the card met networks have barely scratched the surface of. Right. Last year, there were $88 trillion in payments transacted between businesses, according wow. to Jupiter Research. $88 trillion. Another report out of J.P. Morgan Chase estimated that 60% of B2B payments continue to be made by check and ACH. Yeah. And while same-day ACH is faster than traditional ACH, that now is going to be faster than even that. So. Yeah. You know, eventually, I think speed and cost will win the day. Um, as Moody's concluded, quote, lower cost and immediate availability of funds will win over merchants to FedNow. Hmm. But we expect these will lead to FedNow being used in addition to rather than as a replacement for other payment types hmm. as consumers demand more options. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's going to be so interesting just to see how innovation happens with FedNow. Mm -hmm. You know, that's once, exactly it. I agree yeah, with you 100%. Yeah. I think it, it, it isn't one thing I will say, I think it will impact the car brands in one way. And that is, you think about people like our friend Roger McNamara, who runs the, the B2B division mm -hmm. at, at Visa now. Um, right. You know, the, the car brands, as you said, they have been eyeing that market. Right. But it's going to be a little bit trickier. They now, now have a pretty big competitor. I mean, not directly, of course. It's no. going to be about, you know, and so I think I would, uh, what I will be interested in is, you know, that whoever builds the first really good, 
um, B2B transaction with FedNow, Visa is going to buy them. You know that. You know that. You know, you know <laughs> right. that. The second one is going to be bought by MasterCard. By MasterCard, exactly. Right. So it's like, <laughs> right now, I'm sure there's a bunch of people that are uh, like VC backed that are like, all we have to do is we don't even have to have a, a cost. We just have to have a, a solution and then we're going to get bought. Like, you know what I mean? So that's what do you, be- you know, what do you want to bet our, our friend Rogers out, you know, uh, scouring the market yeah, right. for that right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, well, definitely keep us in the loop on this stuff, Patty. Very interesting trend. Thanks, Dan.